भागे इच्छा सुख दुखारी बुढ़ो सत्यं प्रवर्तते सुषुप्तो नस्ति धन्नाशे धस्मात् बुद्धे स्तुनात्मनः रागः attachment इच्छा desire सुख pleasure दुख आदि suffering etc buddhau mind and intellect satyang when it functions pravartate are perceived sushuptau in deep sleep na not asti there is tanase at the destruction of it tasmat therefore buddhe of the mind to only na not atmanaha of the self attachment desire pleasure pain etc are perceived to exist so long as buddhi or mind functions they are not perceived in deep sleep when the mind ceases to exist therefore they belong to the mind alone and not to the atman namaste when i sit down here it's like 3:30 in the morning i have no idea what i'm going to say <laughs> but it's spontaneous and inspired so we're looking at this verse which talks about the mind what is the mind is there really such a thing as the mind not really buddha talks about an aggregate the body is an aggregate the mind is an aggregate the so called personality individuality the ego all these things are aggregates and especially with regard to the mind they are aggregates of thoughts now what is a thought it's an intention i want this i want to do this i want to go here i want to enjoy that and so on so we initiate these acts with thoughts shankara is the buddha's term for it and it comes from a pali word it's not related to shankara or shiva but it's related to a pali word that describes an actor putting on makeup and masks and costumes or something to play a particular character usually uh at a legendary character in a sacred play so this is the mind putting on a face putting on a character creating an ego a personality a character really just like in a play and then we go out into the world and we play this character and we see how it works out well how is it going to work out it's going to be a tragedy because everything that we desire causes suffering how is that because in reality the things that we desire never come to pass or if they do they're not perfect they're not exactly what we desire and even if they are they're only temporary and they will change or disappear or both so because of attachment huh because we experience something that seems pleasurable again to the mind and then we want it again 
or we want it at, on demand whenever we want it. So we become attached. We think of it as mine. Now, this gets into the mula pariyaya, the root sequence of the mind, which is an algorithm, an algorithm that runs by superimposition, a dhyasa. It superimposes the thought of I on the incoming perceptions of the senses. So let's say, for example, we perceive a car. Then the first step is to identify the car. What kind of car is it? And then judge it. Is it a desirable car or an undesirable car? A good car or a bad car? Reliable or unreliable? And so on. And then we project the idea of I on the car that I am in the car, or I am the car, and how would I be as the car? See, and then we think of the car as my car, and imagine ourselves riding around in it, and, you know, everybody looking at us, and admiring us, you know, in the car, giving us their attention, and so on. And finally, we enjoy the car, or the thought of the car, or the thought of owning and enjoying the car. <laughs> Things get very abstract very quickly, because obviously we can't own every single car, even just the ones we like. So what is this? It is the mind fooling itself into believing in the concept of I, the ego, the individuality. Because actually there is no such thing. Actually, there is no such thing as my mind. It's just a collection of thoughts that are stamped, rubber stamped, with I, huh? tagged. If you uh, use a Mac or other file systems, you can tag files with the different tags to indicate their type. And so the mind tags things with I, mine, his, theirs, yours, that, you know, and for undesirable things, bad. <laughs> now this goes on and on basically without any let-up, unless you meditate. And meditation is the process of gradually actually destroying the mind or inhibiting the mind. And it begins by focusing the mind. If you watch your mind, you see it's like all over the universe. It jumps around like a mad monkey from one thing to another, unpredictably. This is the mechanism the mind uses to distract us from the fact that we're suffering. We chase one particular thought or desire, and then when that goes bad, when that bubble bursts, it comes up with another one, and another one, and another one. Every time things seem to go off, to distract us from the fact that the mind cannot predict what's going to happen. It can't, because the mind does not have a comprehensive model of reality. The mind's reality is built on words, and words are abstractions. They are not the things they represent. Language in general is insufficient to describe the reality because the actual reality is transcendence. So that's why the Tao Te Ching begins with the words, the words cannot describe the Tao, the reality, 
Brahman. Why? Because words are symbols. They're abstractions. And an abstraction is a metaphor. And a metaphor is never perfectly identical to the thing that it describes. It can't be, because it's on a higher level of abstraction. Abstraction means leaving out the details and keeping the essence. So when we use words, we are like dealing with a skeleton of the things that they represent. Try to construct a model that will predict how things are going to go. So our model's always wrong because it contains incomplete information. It has to because it's made of words. This leaves us having to compensate again and again for the failure of the mind to accurately predict or estimate what's going to happen. We're always being surprised. And so the mind's cure for that is distraction. Whenever things start to go wrong, it pops up a new bubble. <laughs> oh, this is going to make you happy. No, this. <laughs> no, the Vision Pro is going to make you happy. <laughs> or whatever new thing it comes up with. So is there anything really new under the sun or in the mind? Not really. It's just the same old plot over and over again, you know? Like, uh, take any movie franchise like Terminator or uh, Die Hard or, uh, I don't know, I, I don't watch movies, so I don't even really know. But any of the franchises that have, you know, like Frankenstein, the son of Frankenstein, <laughs> return of the son of Frankenstein, you know, return of the son of the cousin of Frankenstein's dog, you know, it goes on and on. Why? Because once something is shown to be an effective entertainment, an effective distraction, then the urge is to repeat it again and again with slight variations. That's all. See, if, if you actually look into how the mind functions without being fooled by it, you can see it's like a cheap magic show. My Buddhist mentor, Nyanananda, wrote a whole book about this called The Magic of the Mind. And he describes going backstage at a magic show. And from the viewpoint of the backstage view, you can see everything the magician is doing. The secret compartments and the sleight of hand and, you know, the, the fake sleeves. <laughs> that contain, you know, coins or cards or the rabbits or whatever it is the magician is using to create his illusions. They're for you, there is no illusion. For you, because you're not out there in the audience where you can't see what's going on. You've gone backstage and you have a different view. So in the same way, if you go backstage on the mind through meditation and you become the watcher and just watch the mind without being fooled by it, without going into, you know, expanding all the mind's nonsense in waterfalls of thought, papancha, uh, without generating lots of sankharas, based on whatever the mind is coming up with next. Then you see how the mind works. This is how the Buddha discovered the Mula Pariyaya. He simply went into meditation and watched. Because the mind is a one-trick pony. 
superimposition over superimposition over superimposition, on and on and on. So once you know about superimposition and watch for it, you can catch the mind out. You can penetrate its illusions and see to its root. And once you do that, the mind has no more power over you. And this gives you the possibility of rising above the mind. Just like the verse says in Sushupti, in deep sleep, none of the functions of the mind are present. And the same is true of samadhi, because samadhi is entering into sushupti consciousness with awareness. And this is the practice of Raj Yoga. First, narrowing the mind, like through mantras and so on, through worship, through bhakti, devotion, and then finally settling the mind, concentrating on one point, whether it's a deity or a mantra or just pure awareness, Brahman. And then from that point of view, being able to unmask the mind's illusions and transcend the duality of the mind and realize the self. Om Tatsat. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>